Could I have your attention, please? Uh, thank you. Uh, we have some uh, microphone etiquette first from Jeff Fine, our court administrator. Jeff? Thank you, John. Welcome to the Justice Center. Uh, I just need to go over something really quick. Um, by the way, my staff, uh, uh, should you have any questions about the microphones and such, uh, my staff, uh, you usually see them running around with a radio. I won't, this will be my last night here for a couple weeks. I'm going overseas. Uh, real quick, um, we normally live stream most uh, meetings in this facility. However, this particular, these particular meetings will not be live streamed. They will be pre-recorded. They'll be recorded and then they'll be available online uh, within the next three business days. Uh, so uh, about that, because we're amplifying and because we're recording at the same time, we have to re uh, reduce the opportunities for feedback. What that means for you is every time you speak, you need to grab the microphone off the table and you need to hold it a few inches away from your mouth when you have something to say. There's a switch on there so when you're done, so it turns on and off with the switch on the side of the microphone. Uh, we just have to do this to make sure that, that, that your comments get on the record. If you don't use the microphone, they don't get on the record, and if they're not captured in the minutes, they won't be captured later either. So please, uh, sorry for the ink. To start by introducing the mayor, James Cavanaugh, who may have a few words to say, and then the council members that are present also, uh, Joanne Osborne, uh, Joe Pizzillo, and Georgia Lord, uh, will also have a, a brief word of welcome. Uh, Jim, I saw him. Oh, there he is. I uh, was uh, looking at my wife. Wife, raise your hand. There she is. <laughs> and uh, it reminds me of how this started for me. I uh, I was uh, concerned about the council going through the same process, which was very agonizing, in the last budget, and having to repeat it again in this year's budget. It was very trying and very difficult. Uh, so I had suggested to the council that why don't we ask the citizens to give us a hand this time. And, uh, and the council did not disagree and, and we, uh, we moved ahead with this. But that evening I went home and I said to my wife, uh, looks like we're going to have a committee of citizens talking to us about our budget. And she said, I want to be on it. I want to be on it. And uh, I, I told her, no, I'm sorry, but uh, it's it's for those who are not influential on the city on a daily basis or weekly basis. It's, it's uh, for the citizens, those who don't drive us day in and day out, those who don't support us. We want your input. We want a different input, and that's what we're going to do here. So just as uh, I'm sure uh, Ron Lord is with us in spirit as well as Linda, and uh, others that are with us in spirit are those who weren't picked up for this committee. There were 70 some people, and I wasn't part of the selection process, but there were 70 some people, and I know quite a few of those who weren't picked up. So, uh, and they're good. And they could, they could be here, they could do this job. But you were picked, so you have a reason to be very proud of that, I think. And you're gonna be facing quite a challenge. I, I don't consider this task that you have one that is complex, but I would consider it very complicated. And uh, just your approach is complicated. So, so you, you have a job ahead of you. But let, let me just digress for a minute here so you know the governance system in Goodyear. And most of the state of Arizona, it's called the weak mayor concept. And that's contrasting with the strong mayor concept. The weak mayor concept uh, has a mayor, a council, and a city manager and staff. And the mayor, as you know, is ultimately responsible for the conduct of the city. That's what you expect from a mayor, and, and that's true. The council is accountable, accountable to you and every other citizen. The execution, the carrying out of the duty is in the hands of the city manager. And the city manager reports to those seven people on council. Now, this, this is unlike other parts of the country or many other parts of the country where you have what, what they call 
the strong mayor concept where the staff reports to the mayor. But what we do here is fairly customary in the state of Arizona. It's not mandatory, but it's fairly customary. The similarity in the mayor, strong mayor and weak mayor is this. Who do those council member and mayor report to? You. You're the boss. You're the charge. You are literally our boss. And that's how I see it. Now is your opportunity to demonstrate the characteristics of that right and that responsibility. This is a time for you to take advantage of a situation that is really duly yours. You will hopefully be able to tell us what you want us to do. That's what it's all about. Please don't miss that opportunity. You need to set the tone. You need to set the agendas. You need to talk about strategy. You need to talk about how long you're gonna meet. Are you finished with the first report? Or are you gonna have a first report in March and then you wanna continue on and do other things that you see need to be reviewed? You're gonna have to, I think, it's up to you, you're gonna have to consider a chair. What you have to do are, are things which are pretty difficult to do in a large group and very complicated, particularly how do you bite into this elephant? How do you approach it? But that's for you to determine. It's not for someone to tell you. It's for you to take the time and determine how we're gonna do this. And this setting the tone, it might be the most important part of this process. Do not leave here in March or if you continue to June or December frustrated that you didn't achieve what you wanted. You'll achieve what you want by setting the tone tonight. It's in your hands. And uh, it's a tough one. But uh, I thank you very much for doing this. Uh, this you're gonna find to be time consuming. I'm sure you're gonna have a few moments of frayed nerves and discontent. Join the crowd and uh, but that's part of the process. And I think it'll make you certainly a better citizen, a more knowledgeable citizen, and of much, much greater value to us, us being the 62,000 other people in this city. You're now in the lead. Take advantage of it. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Joanne, do you wanna just go down the line and welcome them? Sure, sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, this evening, when I thought about coming in and saying something really smart to you all, I, I did find a quote that is not my own, but I'd like to share it with you because it's, it's short and sweet, and it is that none of us is as smart as all of us. And I thought that was really appropriate for this group setting. And, um, and I want you to know that, that Joe and myself and Frank Cavalier, who couldn't be here tonight because he's at a CDAC meeting, um, we looked at the 70 to 80 um, applicants, and we truly knew that we wanted a broad, diverse group. And, and I know we have it, and I'm very proud of that. And kind of my charge for you all is that you will learn about your city, and you will have fun, and you will be able to give us feedback. And, and I'm so looking forward to that. Um, lastly, I want you to think about the fact that right now you are a group of neighbors um, throughout the city, but you are neighbors, and I hope by the end of this round of months that you will be friends and that um, you have a good time doing this. And I know that is going to be difficult work, but um, I know that you'll be able to take the information and tell your other neighbors and everybody's going to, you know, this group is going to turn into hundreds of other people that we're gonna know more because of you. So I really appreciate that. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Jim. Joe? There's not too much more I can add to uh, what Joanne said. I agree with her 100%, but I'd like to, first of all, thank every one of you. You could be somewhere else other than today in here. And it's, it's I'm really proud looking out at, and again, the uh, participation we had, it was over 70. 
This is a very tough and difficult assignment to try to weed through all of them. But again, like Joanne mentioned, we wanted some diversity, so hopefully every neighborhood would be covered as we kind of go through this process. And we're really looking forward to your feedback. As the policy arm of the city, it's important that we get some direction from you of where you want us to go. And with this diverse background, you know, I'm sure you will come up with this. Uh, but again, I really want to thank you giving up your time and effort to come here and help the city. Uh, I mean, it's always great to get feedback from the citizens, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Well, like all of them have said before me, I thank you very much for the time that you're going to sacrifice on this committee, and it is going to take time, and it's going to take a little study. And what's very nice is it looks like we're going to take business practices and be able to mesh them with government practices, and you're going to find the difference. And so you're going to be challenged on how you can be creative to help us. So I want to, again, once again, express my sincere thanks to each and every one of you. And um, you are going to be the eyes and ears of your neighbors. And so it would be good to have a conversation with your neighbors and tell them what you're doing and tell them the things you're discussing and maybe you'll even get some additional input. So again, have a great time and we expect a lot from you. Thank you. Thanks, Georgia. <laughs> uh, thank you. At this point, I'd like to uh, start with the committee and have each member introduce themselves, uh, their neighborhood, their professional association, uh, the years of residence in this community. And why don't we start with Mike uh, and go around that way. Mike? Thank you. Hi, my everybody. My name is Mike Kiak. I live in Pebble Creek. I'm uh, working on year number three of coming back to Arizona. This is my second stint. I, I like to describe it as I grew up here. Um, I'm a graduate of the Maricopa County Community College District and Arizona State University. So I've uh, spent quite a bit of time in Arizona schools and I'm, I'm glad to be uh, here because I've come home. I currently am serving as an engineering manager at Lockheed Martin uh, out at the Goodyear Airport. I've been with Lockheed pretty close to 25 years now and I've literally roamed the world working for the corporation. So I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this and I'm very interested in the city and its future and its success. So thank you for the invitation to be a part of it. My name is Charlie Kagan. I live in Pebble Creek. I've been living there for 12 years since I retired from um, working at the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I was uh, budget director and internal control director for the welfare department in Massachusetts for a few years. And I was also city auditor slash controller for a city for about five years before I went to the welfare department and after that I retired. I have a BS in finance from the University of Mass, and I'm looking forward to doing some good work on this committee. Uh, my name is Rain Gray. I live in uh, Surrey Mountain Ranch, and um, I work for the city of Phoenix uh, as a firefighter for the fire department, and I have a master's degree in public administration. So I'm hoping to take that education and apply it uh, in the real world and hopefully you'll learn a little bit and uh, contribute some. Hello, I'm Evelyn Nelson. Uh, I'm a Goodyear resident for five years now. I'm very pleased to be in the company of such an esteemed body of people this evening. Uh, in my former life, before retirement, uh, I was a native Washingtonian. Uh, lived there, what I like to say, for the first 55 years. I'm gonna spend the next 55 here. So uh, I retired from the superintendency of the Cleelum Roslyn School District, which is approximately 80 miles east of Seattle. So um, welcome all. I'm thrilled you're here. This is going to be a fun evening. Good evening, everybody. My name is Arthur Lewis. I am a manager with Federal Express. I've been with them for 19 years. I am a uh, Goodyear resident for two years. I live off 175th and Canyon Trails, number 27, however many there are right now. And uh, like everybody else here, I'm looking forward to learning a lot about my community and helping out with the budgeting and making sure that the citizens are taken care of. Uh, Kevin, do you want to go next? Hi, uh, my name is Kevin Bates. I've um, been a good year resident for about five years now. live in the Cotton Flower neighborhood. Um, I grew up in uh, uh, Kansas and I moved out here. Um, I work for the uh, University 
for Arizona State University. Uh, I've been a business manager and accountant for um, a few years there now uh, for a few different departments. And uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to learning a lot right here. Hi, my name's, <coughs> excuse me. Hi, my name's Anthony Jurakos. I live in Australia Mountain Ranch. I've been a Goodyear resident since the year 2000. I work for Wells Fargo as a home mortgage consultant. I've been in the mortgage industry for the last 13 years. I have a bachelor's degree in finance and I'm presently working towards my MBA as well. And like everyone else, I'm uh, ready to help out my city and see what I can do to try to make this a good place for my family to grow. Good evening, my name is Gary Gelzer. I uh, live in Goodyear for 10 years now. I live in Pebble Creek. Um, I'm currently serving as the chairman of the Goodyear Planning Commission. I've been on the commission for seven years. I have an MBA from Dartmouth College. Good evening, my name is Bill Stipp. Um, currently uh, at working as a uh, contracting consultant for the Department of Defense. Recently retired after 26 years in the fire service, uh, most recently here in the city of Goodyear. Um, I uh, have a bachelor's degree in uh, fire service administration, have spent, like I said, the last 26 years working in local government um, in all positions from uh, department director um, all the way from a new employee. So I'm really looking forward to uh, bringing some of the local government flavor um, to the group as well. Hi, my name's Joan Shield. Uh, a, I, a little bit about my personal background. I was a single parent. Uh, my husband divorced me. I worked two jobs every day to stay off of the welfare roll. So I believe in uh, really being a responsible citizen. And I developed and started from scratch two companies, ran them successfully for 23 years, and ended up selling them to TransUnion, the major credit wholesaler in, the in, in our country. So uh, I look forward to ha supporting uh, and learning about the city government part, and I look forward to contributing my knowledge on the business angle and making sure that our, our city is a very prosperous, growing city. Good evening, <coughs> my name is Larry Price and I've lived and grew up in Arizona for been here about 60 some years. I live in uh, Palm Valley, Desert Breeze area. I have an, a business administration uh, degree, majored in accounting for, I'm retired now. Uh, for the last 30 some years, I've worked in municipal finance in several cities uh, in the state of Arizona, in including Goodyear. Uh, Monica, do you want to continue? Hello, I'm Monica Stigler. I have been a resident of Goodyear for a little over two years. I live in the Canyon Trails area. Uh, I've got a master's degree in public administration, and I currently work as a researcher and policy analyst for Morrison Institute for Public Policy. Good evening. Uh, my name is Marvin Fair. I'm a uh, resident of Pebble Creek. I've lived in Goodyear for 10 years ever since uh, retiring. My um, educational and work experience um, has been very diversified. Um, I have two um, master's degrees, one in health administration, the other in accounting. Uh, the former from Loma Linda University in California, the latter from uh, the University of Oklahoma. My work experience um, has been uh, 20 years in the U.S. Air Force. I had 12 years in um, a school district. I served as the um, uh, assistant uh, superintendent for business services. And the uh, remaining 10 years that I worked was in um, health administration. Uh, good evening, and thank you for the selection. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Barry Hamp and I live in the Madera development of Palm Valley. I've been in Goodyear for just a little over two years. Uh, currently, I work for Western Regional Medical Center, uh, Cancer Treatment Centers of America for the last three years. Two of those have been spent here. I'm the senior vice president there, and my background is, my bachelor's background is uh, science and chemistry, and my master's degree is in business. 
Good evening. My name is Scott Mikes. I've uh, lived in Goodyear for about three years now in the Palm Valley area. I've um, taught for about eight years in the Southwest Valley in the educational system here, uh, anywhere from sixth to twelfth grade. I currently teach at La Jolla Community High School in Avondale uh, English. Taught government for the past six years, though, so this is a new transition for me. And uh, I have my master's in uh, educational administration. Uh, my name is Al Osorio. I live in the Estrella Mountain Ranch. Uh, I've been in the West Valley since 1979. I'm a graduate of New York University. I have a master's there, too. Uh, I've also a graduate degree from Hofstra University School of Administration. I'm currently uh, a believer in digital reading. Uh, I'm a published author. Uh, I run a publishing business here in uh, Goodyear. Uh, I want to thank those that selected me. And uh, I like to believe uh, that serving for the community is very important. I've been involved in water resources, uh, the uh, Brownsville Project, and also a former president of the local support group for the library. Thank you very much. Charles. Yeah, my name is Charles Rothacker. Um, I work for federal government. I'm retired now. I retired in 2006. I was um, at one point a uh, controller, business manager. And when I was in California, also a certified public accountant with the government. I um, now work for the Phoenix Suns and Arizona Diamondbacks. Part-time, I live in Australia, and I've been here six years. Hi, I'm Terry Lukshaitis. We've lived here almost two years. I'm a teacher for... Murphy Elementary s and at Bear Sullivan School, and I teach where I teach computers. My background, though, I have a bachelor's degree in accounting, and my master's degree in educational administration. I've spent, I would say, twelve of my years as an accountant and about twenty years as an educator. <laughs> so, so kind of diverse, mixing it up a little bit. Good evening. My name is Lynn Eidelman. I've been a resident of Canyon Trail since 2006. I was transferred with my company, which is a building material supplier in these tough times. <laughs> and um, I am a district manager for them. Um, and I look forward to serving. This is the first opportunity I've had to serve the community, and I truly look forward to it. Hello, my name is Josh Papworth. Um, been in Goodyear, living in Goodyear about five years in the Centera community. Um, I'm a practicing civil engineer and uh, I just have a bachelor's degree from Arizona State University. Uh, Greg, do you, oh, I'm sorry, Catherine. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for the selection. Um, it's very nice meeting everyone and I look forward to working with everyone. Um, I started out in my professional career and I call it my other life as a nurse. Uh, so I have a degree in nursing and um, when I was going back to school to think about getting a, 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 a nurse uh, practitioner degree, all of a sudden I just decided no, that wasn't for me. I've been dealing with a lot of administrative tasks and I went back and got my degree in business from Pacific Lutheran University and um, up in Washington State. Love it very much. And I've lived in Palm Valley here for about nine years and um, have worked on numerous committees. And uh, from going um, after working in utilization review with uh, insurance companies for medical, I then went into the pharmaceutical business. So I've seen uh, a lot, lot of different uh, aspects of the medical um, industry. So. Thank you very much and look forward to it all. Thank you, Catherine. Greg? Nope, how about that? Hi, I'm Greg Hansen. Um, been living in Australia for about six years now. Spent uh, 15 summers in Arizona. Um, I work for a, a large company. We're about $8 billion in revenue. We're called Ashland. And um, I am. Um, responsible for a budget, just um, like many of you are, so I get it. I understand the pressure that everybody's under, so I'm really looking forward to serve, serving with all of you on this committee and uh, hopefully doing the right thing for, for the city of Goodyear. Thank you. My name is Josh Hong. I've been a resident of Goodyear since 2003. 
and I've been practicing restorative dentistry in Arizona since 2002 and been operating and own dental office since the, for the last five years. And um, I'm really excited to be part of this group. Hello, um, my name is Lulu Klau. I have been living in Goodyear about 10 years. Uh, currently, I work for uh, Maricopa Community College District. I have been a budget manager for the last uh, five years over there, but I have been working for the Community College District for the last 14 or 15 years. Uh, my education background is I have accounting degrees from Arizona State University and MBA in finance from uh, Walden University. I'm looking forward to help the city balance the budget. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Ed Smith with uh, living over at uh, Desert Vista, just the other side of uh, Indian School. Um, I've been uh, in the area now for just over eight years and um, decided it was time I started to do it, giving something back to it. It's been a good community for me. Um, I retired from the Air Force where I spent 15 years in Europe. Uh, really enjoyed that. Uh, came here with a start of small business myself, uh, quit that, taught for several years uh, in a public and private school system. And uh, currently I work for Waddell and Reed as a financial advisor. Uh, my name is Howard Broadbeck. Uh, my wife and I have owned a home in uh, Pebble Creek for about six years now. Uh, we just recently retired this past year um, uh, to live full time here in Goodyear. Uh, See, I'm a, I'm a mechanical engineer for my bachelor's. I have an MBA and also a BA in applied science. I have retired from a Fortune 200 chemical company where I was a division vice president and a global vice president of procurement. Thank you very much. Let's give a quick round of applause to the committee. You know, this is really incredible. What a committee. I mean, you know, it's daunting to recognize all of you and to look forward to working with all of you. And it's 100% uh, attendance tonight. That's, that's wonderful. I'll just briefly tell you who I am. I'm John Fishbach, city manager. I've been a city manager for over 30 years. I've worked in uh, Lake Forest, Illinois for 12 years, uh, Fort Collins, Colorado for nine years, Vancouver, Washington for five years. I've been here about a year and three quarters right now, and Robbinsdale, Minnesota for two and a half, three years. Um, I have a, a bachelor's degree from Pacific Lutheran University. I didn't know, Catherine, you were from there. Um, a long time ago, and my master's degree is from the University of Kansas. I'd like to briefly introduce the key members of my staff, and I apologize to the rest of the staff because I'm not going to be introducing you tonight, but you, they will get to see you uh, later. Uh, Brian Dahlke, a deputy city manager. Uh, Mark Gaylord, an interim deputy city manager. Mario Saldamondo is uh, an assistant to the city manager. Uh, Rorick Massey up here is the city attorney. Uh, next to him is Kim Bradford. She is a fantastic uh, note taker. So she is going to keep us all on track for after the meeting. And then Lynn Muhal, uh, Muhal is the city clerk. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dick Bowers, who is the facilitator that we have engaged for this. Uh, Dick comes to us as a retired city manager from the city of Scottsdale for many years. He's had a fantastic career, and I think that you will really enjoy him. Dick? Thank you, John. Good evening, folks. Um, I'm, I'm sort of like a tour guide, um, but I'm, I'm like a tour guide that doesn't determine the destination of the tour. So, so my job as a facilitator is to help you get where you want to be. And ultimately, where you want to be is where the council, in adopting the resolution that created this body, asked you to get to. So it was to, to, take, to, to understand what's, what's going on in the city and, and the economics of it and how things flow, uh, and to take a look at that with serious intent and understanding the rather Herculean task you face, um, and then to give them advice in this most difficult time, in this most difficult challenge, of making decisions that are unpleasant, but in the best interest of the community. So I, I've been in local government for s about 41 years. 
uh, with 31 of those being uh, in local government, 23 of them with the city of Scottsdale, eight with the state of New York and a public benefit corporation. Sort of a public body that operated like a business. It was called the New York State Thruway Authority. So it very much had to have a business perspective because it's functioned independently financially from the state. I have my own business, R.A. Bowers and Associates. It's, Associates, it's a consulting business uh, within which I do many of these things. Uh, I'm adjunct professor at UCLA's Anderson School and an active professor at ASU teaching one course every year, the only one that teaches it as a requirement to get out of the MPA program and it's public entrepreneurship. So my, my history is entrepreneurial, even within the government. I am honored and pleased to be here. I think it's going to be an exciting time. I wanna go back to the mayor's comments and reiterate the point that you own this. I mean, today you're going to hear a discussion about the budget. You, these are things you've got to know and, and, and understand and ask questions about. But following that, you and I are going to discuss how you want this thing to flow. I'm gonna make some suggestions, but that's all they are as starting points. What you need to do is collectively converse uh, and determine what's gonna be the best way to get from where we are now to that destination of thoughtful, well-informed, valuable advice to the council. Fair enough? So maybe just one more little bit. Uh, uh, I, I currently do a few other things. Uh, the consulting business and the teaching are where my heart is. It's a reason I retire, retired to not go to so many meetings, uh, but to, to enjoy the exploration of, of our business that I find to be the most exciting thing around is what happens in local government because it's about you. I also am very active in arts nonprofits. Uh, my business runs the Herberger Theater Center and my business manages the Phoenix Boys Choir. So we have a lot of areas that we touch and that we're very fond of. So tonight, this is yours. Let me get run through a few points uh, to get us started. We've had our welcome and introductions. The purpose of the committee, this is the purpose of the committee. This is directly from the resolution adopted by the council, 091347. A lot of this is in your book, and in a minute I'm gonna walk you through your book very quickly. One, to make sure you've got all the sections. And secondly, so if there, to just give you about a, a one minute version of what we need in a couple of those. So become informed about city services programs and funding. Uh, it, it, it's, what did the mayor say? It's not complex, but it's complicated. There's a lot of moving parts. Some of them you think if you move this over here, nothing happens, but you find that there's a string that ties it to over here. So we wanna have those kinds of conversations to inform you. To provide input on services, programs, priorities, identify potential cost savings, to look at new possible revenue sources, and to make recommendations to the city council. That's your charge. And that's where we'll focus our suggestions for process. And then ultimately, again, you make the decisions of how we go. The role of the council, committee, facilitator, staff, I'll get into that in just a minute. And then we'll do a little housekeeping. Since you are a, a, a public body created by the council, you'll sign a co the code of ethics and you'll take an oath of office in essence, uh, as, as you must. Uh, the Goodyear budget processing calendar, these will be discussions that we'll have to begin to inform you on how this whole thing flows. And then after that, we will have that discussion about how should we go forward? What's the best process? Again, I'll make some recommendations, but at no time, at no time do you lose the control of how this thing goes, and understand that. If I make a suggestion, you add to it, improve it, and make it your own. Fair enough? I will also give you my email address. Let me do it right now so we don't forget it along the way. Because if you have any questions, comments, things you want, we wanna go through me. Send them to me, I will immediately follow up on those things and get them back to you. It's Dick Bowers, all one word, D-I-C-K-B-O-W-E-R-S, at R-A-Bowers.com. That's Richard Allen. Dot com. Okay, that's it, and I look at that every day many times, and if you have a request or something you need, we'll, we'll get to it. We'll also set up a, a website page section, however we call it, for you, so that some of those things, if you request from me, 
I'll get a hold of, of somebody in the, in the city, they'll post that to the website. So that everybody, if anybody asks for anything, everybody gets it. And, and so that you'll all be informed about what each other are asking and, and, and what information you might need. Uh, while, I'm, while I'm sharing these few thoughts, can I pass this around? I need to sign this each time. We'll send around one of these every time, every time we meet. It's an attendance sheet. And so we'll have that discussion at the end. Uh, me, oh my. There we go. The role as a city council is the client for the effort, the ultimate decision maker, the creator of this body. And their role is to, is to define it, describe it, request from it, and then to turn it loose. The committee, chartered by the council, would advise them and to take ownership of this process. The facilitator, I'm a supportive consultant to the city council and to the committee. You are my client. So your interest is my interest. City staff, professional topic experts to inform you and to respond as needed to support the committee. That's their role. And finally, the role of the public. While the public is welcome to attend, there is no public comment at these meetings. But certainly, as, as several, the mayor, I believe, and, and, and several of the council members suggested, you'll be talking with your neighbors. And you can share ideas, you can get ideas, and, and you can feed and expand the influence of this august body. Ground rules, everything has to have some ground rules. These are a test. Uh, so if there's any up here that you want to debate, discuss, expand on, or add to, just say so. But the ground rules are something we'll post on the wall every time we meet and just remind ourselves this, this is how we said we would interact in the process. Is this in anybody's way? One of the things, members of the committee, suffering is optional. So. So if there's anything you need to make you more comfortable or make it more useful, you just let me know. And um, so everyone participates. Just from you going around introducing yourself, there are no shy people here. Uh, you're going to speak your mind, and that's exciting. Uh, respect differing viewpoints, because I'm just convinced you're going to hear them. And you're going to have them. Silence is agreement. If, if you're asked your thoughts on something and you're silent, then whoever is speaking is going to win the day. That makes sense? So we have to make sure we get involved, even at times in debate. Um, share airtime fairly. There's a lot of you in here. No one or two or three can, can dominate the airspace. So I will be the one to say, let's, can we get along with that uh, occasionally? I don't mean to be offensive, but in the interest of an incredible task in a short period of time, we need to move the process along. Um, limit side conversations during the meeting. Minimize those because they can be disruptive. Uh, all treated the same. We will treat each one of you the same. Uh, so again, if one person asks, we'll treat, we'll give everybody the information so that nobody perceives that anybody else is getting a favorable treatment. Start on time, end on time. You okay with that? We don't know yet what on time is. That's for you to determine at the end of this evening, but I will always start right at the time that you say we're going to start, and so we encourage you to be here. Each serves as an individual. I think this is important. You're going to sit in groups. You're going to discuss in groups. We're going to inform ourselves across the table. Um, but when it comes down to making the observations at the end of this process, my strong advice is that you don't try to seek some grand consensus, but that each one of you will have some sort of a rating form that will, will be very simple and, and adaptable to what any way you want to go about it. But each one of you will do the work of offering your position. My job will be to take all those positions, fold them into a report, bring it back to you, and make sure that everybody is represented fairly. So if there's dominant viewpoints, we'll see those. If there's subordinate viewpoints, we'll see those. And if there's a one of viewpoint, we'll see those, but we'll see them in context. So you'll meet as a group, but ultimately make your observations as individuals. Anything else from your standpoint that you think would be important to to add to the basic kind of ground rules that, that we'll function with. Are you okay with these? Sir. I think Mayor was talking about earlier how this group is just committee is comprised of people who do not have frequent interaction with council members or city manager. But yes. I was just listening to what everybody is doing for their living. And I think, and then this Mr. Galzer, I think he's 
account or um, does something for the planning and zoning, doesn't it? He's on the planning with commission. Right. Doesn't that mean he inter account, interacts with uh, city managers and city council on a frequent basis, doesn't it? He's, he's not, he, he is a volunteer on a public, on a public board, but has no, nothing to gain by his interaction with anybody else. He may have more knowledge about some things, but that's, that's not a, a position that would create any kind of a conflict of interest within this body. There are other people who have interacted at times with the city and have perhaps a very strong knowledge of some topical area, uh, but no conflicts of interest. Anybody else want to? Okay, so we'll go with these. Hey, if you change as we go along, uh, feel free to share an idea. This will be posted up every time we, we meet. Um, the uh, sign-in sheets being passed around. Uh, uh, a couple little housekeeping things that if I don't tell you now, I might lose them because they're not up here in the, in the graphics. Uh, next Wednesday, P and Z meets in here, third Wednesday of every month. Planning and zoning meets in here. Uh, my suggestion is that that week, although we have conceptually thought we could meet every week if you want for five or six weeks to get through all the material you need to and have all the conversations you need to, but I might suggest that we skip next week, give you a week to digest all of this, and because we don't have a place to do it. Sir? The following week you won't be here? Well, you won't miss two in a row because if, if we don't do it next week, that doesn't count as anybody missing anything because you won't do anything. No one will show up next week. We just don't have a place to do it. And we may face the same thing the third week in February. Not even a bit, sir. Not a bit. You'll lose the continuity of the day. Yes, sir. Yeah, it'll be on video and broadcast and... We'll also s continue to send you all the information, the notes, whatever. Absolutely. The, um, mentioned a website, bingo, bango, bango, got it. So let me move on. We have, I said we had a few little housekeeping things to do. So I'd like to turn it over for discussion of opening meeting, open meeting law, and you're also going to sign your your, um, your agreement, your code of ethics that's in your book. So let's take just a second before we turn it over to just a second to take your book and let's walk through it very, very quickly. First thing is obvious, it's the agenda. And it shows you'll do the city loyalty oath and you'll understand the ethics policy, which you will then sign and get back to us at the next meeting. You s uh, the oath is there under that tab for oath, it's very simple and straightforward. The ethics policy is going to take some time for you to read, so you're not expected to read that right now. Uh, the next are a replication of the slides that you have today in the presentation and discussion from the city manager. The next is the city map. which is probably a fold out from the general plan. Very useful. The next is some details, city demographics, population over the, over the, the last decade plus. The next is some demographic profiles of the community. These are just background for you to have a sense of that, that don't answer any of the questions you're asked and charged with, but they are information that you may find useful in that frame of reference. The next is a series of articles that, again, may help to inform you in this difficult decision process. The next is simply a place to take notes. I really strongly, strongly encourage you to take notes. This is like a college course in a sense because the, your final test doesn't come till the end. And some of the things you talk about early on are going to have to be blended into comments you hear along the way. So I strongly encourage you to take notes to help you recall some of your thoughts and perspectives. In the next is some miscellaneous information followed by a little pocket with little tabs in it that you can then use to expand the separations within your, within your workbook. So if I could turn it over to Lynn Mulhall. 
Good evening. It's my privilege to give you your loyal have you take your loyalty oath and if you have it in front of you, if you would raise your right hand and then just repeat after me saying your name in the appropriate spot. I do solemnly affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution and laws of the state of Arizona. that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same and defend them against all enemies. Foreign and domestic and that I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of budget committee member. According to the best of my ability, so I do so affirm. And if you would all please sign in the appropriate spot and just move them forward, pass them forward, and I'll collect them. Thank you. This is you're not. Now, speaking of ethics policy, we're going to have a little discussion of the ethics policy so you understand the foundation for it. Are there any of these missing? Anybody? Thank you. Please. Oh, I'm sorry. Are we going to talk about, I'm sorry, the open meeting law? Yeah. Okay, you didn't want to say anything about the ethics policy? Not unless they want to hear my 30 minute presentation. You want to hear the 30 minute presentation or do you want to read it or later? You want the, uh, the one minute version. <laughs> I thought so. Uh, I'll just briefly in your materials, you have a copy of the uh, uh, Connecticut Your Ethics Handbook. Uh, Catherine Wallinger was on our committee uh, that got together over the course of about a year last year to put together this. This document, which represents basically the, city, uh, the citizens' values statement as far as what they feel that uh, our city uh, committees, employees, and council members, what the ethical values that they should reflect in the performance of their duties. So they compiled this document, and one of the requirements that uh, is in this document is that all our city committees uh, need to read and acknowledge that document upon taking their oath of office. So uh, I'm, I'm always available to answer any questions you may have on the, on the handbook, but what you need to know tonight is uh, there is an acknowledgement form that you need to sign uh, prior to the next meeting. Uh, you don't have the right form, I just noticed, so I'm going to get copies made this evening and pass them out before the end of the evening. And again, uh, just read over your ethics handbook and then sign this acknowledgement form and turn it in at the next meeting. Thank you. I am going to give you just a brief overview of Arizona Open Meetings Laws. We thought it would be a good idea just to go over this real quickly. Why do we have an open meeting law? And I will cover that. Who must comply? What is a meeting? What is required? And where would you go for additional information? So first, why do we have such a law? Very simple. Public business should be done in public. All meetings of any public body 
shall be public meetings and all persons so desiring shall be permitted to attend and listen to the deliberations and proceedings. All legal action of public bodies shall occur during a public meeting. And because you're an appointed committee, you are a public body. So the purpose of the open meeting law is to open the conduct of business of the government to the scrutiny of the public and to ban decision making in secret. The new buzzword is transparency. It means the same thing. And who must comply? Well, you are a public body. You were appointed. You're an advisory committee. So you must comply as well as the other commissions that are part of the city and the city council. And what is a meeting? This is a meeting tonight, but a meeting has a more general definition. It's a gathering in person or through technological devices of a quorum of members of a public body at which they discuss, propose, or take legal action, including any deliberations by a quorum with respect to such action. So there's 26 members on your committee, which means a quorum would be 14 members. So if you're at the ballpark at spring training and this committee is still working together, 14 of you shouldn't be seen standing together talking. It would, it would be perceived as you were having a secret meeting deciding on, on things. So you just need to be aware of that. The open meeting laws require advance notice. You have to post your agendas 24 hours in advance. It does require an agenda which will describe the items that you're going to be talking about. You can't pull things out, come to the meeting and have want a discussion on something that's not on the agenda because the public would not be aware of that. There may be some issues the public may want to come and sit and listen to the discussions. And so if you discuss something that wasn't published on the agenda and they miss that opportunity, it wouldn't be fair. You also need minutes. So the agenda must include, and this is just a sample of a city council agenda, you have to show the time, the date, and the place. And you have to show what you're going to be discussing during the meeting. So at the meeting, you'll determine a quorum. If you don't have 14 people here, you're not having a meeting because you have to have a quorum to have a meeting. If you were to, if someone was here to give a presentation, you could sit and listen to it, but it wouldn't be recorded in any formal minutes and it wouldn't be considered a minute and you certainly could, could not discuss it. You could listen to the presentation, but you could not discuss it during that, that not meeting, the unmeeting. Persons addressing when you speak, you should state your name because it makes it easier for the minute taker until she or he gets to know your name and who you are. So when you speak, you should, you should state your name. Accessibility is required. The ADA has very strict guidelines. Everyone needs to have access to come to your meetings. And the minute taker will, if you take action, the minute keeper taker will record that motion and the action. After the meeting, the minutes or a recording must be available within 10 working days. That's the law. We have to provide that information. And we have a system in Goodyear where we will publish those minutes or notes to our website. So anyone, and we'll have the um, video as well. And if you want more information, you can always go online. You can ask questions to Rorick. You can contact the county attorney or the um, general attorney, attorney general. So in summary, the most important things to remember are conduct your meeting in public. You must have a quorum to have a meeting and to have that discussion. You must post your agenda 24 hours in advance. If you want to add something to your agenda after 24 hours, you, you cannot. You can amend agenda up to 24 hours, but once that 24-hour mark is gone, then you cannot change it. And you may only discuss the things that are on the agenda. And if you violate that, there are penalties. So don't let it scare you. It's here to protect you, and it is um, there to protect the public as well. Okay? Turn it back over to John. Are there any questions on either of those two presentations? Anything? Okay, good.
Thank you, Dick. Um, now you, you get bored to death. <laughs> and I apologize for that. Um, my presentation to you this evening is going to be about budgets, budget processes. I'll also be providing you some information on budget, trends, impacts, uh, things that uh, we're facing every day here in the city uh, so that you have a better understanding of how the city budget process works. This is the uh, um, calendar that the city follows for the preparation of the budget. The key dates, we started last October. We gave a presentation to the city council in work session on a financial forecast. Uh, can everybody hear me? I'm sorry. Thank you. I uh, gave a presentation to the city council on the uh, financial forecast. Uh, you'll see January uh, 11th uh, is a work session. We did that this last Monday evening. And then the next was January to March, the Citizens Budget Committee. So that's where you fit in here. And then on through the process that we'll follow up into until the July adoption of the tax levy. All of this is stipul stipulated by state law, so we have to follow this calendar. Since most of the committee's work experience is in the private sector, we thought it important to point out the differences between the private and the public sector. Many of our employees came to us from the private sector, and they're always shocked and surprised at the difficulty of transitioning from private to public. Let me go over some of the comparisons um, that are up on the board. Strategic feature, the strategic goal, for example. Private sector, you have competitiveness. In the public sector, you have mission effectiveness. Under financial goals, you have pri profit, growth, market share in the private sector. Under the uh, public sector, you have a balanced budget and efficiency. Under values, under the private sector, you have innovation, creativity, goodwill, brand recognition. Under the public sector, accountability to the public, integrity, fairness, creativity, and innovation. Desired outcome is customer satisfaction for both of us. Uh, without satisfied customers, uh, it's difficult to operate. It's difficult to stay in business if you're in the private sector and difficult perhaps to stay on the city council if you're in the public sector. Uh, stakeholders, you have the stockholders, owners, and users in the private sector, and then you have the residents and businesses in the public sector. Budget defined by customer market demand in the pub private sector, and leadership uh, and customer needs in the public sector. Uh, decision making is a very private process in the private sector, and in the public sector, it's a public process. As Lynn mentioned, transparency is the catchword these days. It's a transparent process, and it's frequently played out in the media. Key success factors for the private sector are growth rates, earnings, market share, uniqueness, advanced technology. And in the public sector, sector, you have best management practices, economies of scale, commonalities with other cities, and standardized technology. Goodyear, like most cities, uh, budget on a one-year basis although some cities have to two-year budgets. I'm a strong advocate for two-year budgets. We can't do it here in Arizona, but I have uh, uh, in Vancouver, Washington, we converted the city of Vancouver to a two-year budget while I was there, and we did it in Fort Collins, Colorado also while I was there. Two-year budget makes a lot more sense. You're looking out a little further into the future than just year to year. We're on a fiscal year budget, not a calendar year budget. All state, all cities in the state have to be on a fiscal year. F our fiscal year is July 1st to June 30th. Uh, the calendar year budgets, obviously, are a lot of states in Fort Collins, we were on a calendar year budget, all, all the cities were in Colorado. Uh, but a fiscal year budget, you work from July 1st till uh, June 30th. The fiscal year 9 and 10 total budgets, uh, to illustrate the components of a budget, we'll use this year's budget. Uh, the fiscal year 9-10, so fiscal year 9, uh, 2009, 2010 is the descriptor for this fiscal year, and that's because it started July 1st in 2009 
and it ends on June 30th of 2010. The total budget for this fiscal year is $375 million. The capital improvement plan and one-time expenses account for the largest portion of that, and that's almost 67%. The operating budget, which runs the city, is 19%, including all departmental salaries, commodities, and contractual services. Grants represent 3% of the budget, debt service 6%, and the contingency or rainy day fund set aside for unseen or emergency expenditures is at 5%. Yeah. How much is that for um, the Let's try it. Yes, go ahead and, and we'll try it and see how. Howard Broadbeck, question. Um, uh, we were sent material by Mario prior to the meeting, and but it was only up, I think, until 2004 information as far as what the city budgets were and that sort of thing. And I can't recall, but what was the, do you remember what the percentage of debt service was in the, in the through the information that he sent us, what, how much that's uh, either No, I don't, from? but we can sure respond to that later. Okay. okay. And that's what Kim will be doing, so uh, she will make sure it doesn't fall through the cracks. Um, where the money goes, the operating budget which, which runs the city, including all departmental salaries, uh, commodities and contractual services represents 19% of the budget, the total budget. This operating budget consists of two parts. Most of it's in the general fund, about 15% or $60 million. The other 4% includes mostly enterprise funds such as sewer, water, sanitation, funds that you charge rates for and the rates pay for themselves. The general fund is the key fund that we will be dealing with in the future weeks. Uh, but before we get to the general fund, I want to go over some of the other sections of the budget. The operating expenditures by department. This is a look at the $73 million operating budget by department. Public safety, police and fire make up almost a third of it. There's 19% for police, 14% for fire. Public works is the next largest, public works and water resources, which makes up, I'm sorry. Sorry, thank you, thanks Gary. Uh, public works and water resources make up more than a quarter. So these three departments uh, make up almost over 60% of the budget. Larry? The operating budget is what we uh, pay the salaries for, contractual services, and ongoing expenses of that nature. Uh, no, it does not. Um, it, it's paid for through the capital improvement uh, budget and through the uh, from the tax levy for the secondary property tax and the uh, if and I'll get into that in a moment if it's necessary we have to subsidize it with the general fund. Of what is involved, I mean. You know, 19% represents how many dollars and this type of thing. Uh, certainly. Uh, we can, uh, all of that's in the material that you've been provided, but 19% uh, is million, or excuse me, 73 million. 15% of that is 60 million. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, the other 4% is, uh, is the other funds. But we can get all of that for you. Capital improvements, the biggest section in the pie uh, was the capital, the, uh, was the green area, and that repre represents capital and one-time money. Let's start with an ex explanation of capital improvements. The bricks and mortar of the city, the infrastructure, buildings, equipment, generally items costing more than $50,000. Capital improvement projects involve long-term planning. They are prioritized over a five-year period and can last for several years. They're funded typically through impact fees, 
bonds, grants, and general funds. They are one-time projects funded with one-time money. So let's talk about one-time and ongoing. What does that mean? Let me start with the ongoing money. Property taxes collected every year on each house, building, or piece of land. User fees paid monthly as for water and sewer and trash services. State shared tax revenues collected monthly from highway funds and things like that. Excise sales tax, which is collected monthly for goods purchased in Goodyear at stores and restaurants. One-time monies are impact fees from developers. Fees collected only once a, on a house when somebody starts building and they have to pay for the growth. Construction sales tax collected only once and on each home or building that's being built. Bond proceeds borrowed for debt. Non-budgeted surplus balance at end of budget year due to higher revenues or cost savings. And grants, money only comes in for a certain period of time and then stops and rainy day funds set aside for emergencies, they can only be used for one-time purposes. Now that I've explained some of the ongoing versus the one-time, let's talk about one-time and uh, operating or ongoing a little further. Capital expenditures to a building or to buy a telephone system are one-time expenses, primarily funded with one-time money, impact fees, or bonds. Operating and maintenance costs of those new buildings or phone systems are an ongoing expense that you have to account for year after year. Our policy is to fund one-time costs with one-time money and ongoing costs with ongoing money. We make every effort not to pay ongoing costs with one-time money because one-time monies are not uh, sustainable. Sustainability is a key to good budgeting. Now, I say that we make every effort not to spend uh, ongoing uh, one-time, ongoing resources to pay for uh, one-time things. The city of Goodyear, for example, has gotten into the baseball business, and in order to do that, we have to pay from the general fund monies to pay what we refer to as pick bonds. Those pick bonds that built the stadiums are costing the general fund roughly $8.8 .8 million a year. And so that's coming straight off the top of the general fund in order to pay for those, uh, in order to pay for spring training. What was the total of those bonds that cost $8.8 .8 million per year to service? Um, what I'm trying to get at is, is what's the what's the what's the city's cost of money at this point for capital money? Do you know what that percentage is? Well, we just sold some bonds Monday night uh, that uh, they were uh, the new bonds that are subsidized by the federal government, and it worked out to a net interest rate of 3.9 percent. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. What what I'm asking though is this six percent of the total budget, which is debt service. Mm -hmm. What is that percentage? I mean, you, you just said that the ongoing bonds are 3.9 percent, but historically, I mean, do, does anybody know what our average cost of money is and how, you know, those bonds can be of varying lengths and that sort of thing? Varying lengths. We'll have to get that information for you, but yes. Okay. And then okay. If, one last question is you just said these pick bonds are $8.8 .8 .8 million of, your, of the city's total debt service. Mm -hmm. So is, would, that, would, it, would I be accurate in saying of the 6 percent, which accounts, which, which comes to about $22 million, about half of it, or 8.8 .8 million, is for the ballpark. Uh, no, that no. is uh, separately accounted for as as a separate item in the general fund. Oh, so, so that's that in addition to the six percent debt service that's shown in this pie chart. Yes, it is. Brian, is that correct? Well, we w let us get back to you with the proper answer. So, thank you, John. Bill Stipp, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. The um, on the slide that you had prior to this one, you said non-budgeted surplus balance at the end of the budget year due to higher revenues or cost savings are considered one-time monies. Yes. Can you explain what that would? 
how would that would come to be or is that left over from unspent money from the general fund? Yes. Is, is that I think so, uh, some of the future slides will address that specifically, Bill. If not, I'd be happy to try to answer that later. Okay, I'll wait. Thank you. Thank you. Almost 10% of the total budget is made up of debt service and grants. Uh, debt service or grants is 3% of the budget, and then debt service is 6% of the budget. Special uh, for grants, it's a special revenue from the federal government typically or foundations. And debt service is repayment of bonds sold to fund one-time capital expenditures, uh, uses property tax as one source of revenue. As long as we're talking about property tax, I may as well explain how it can be used. The city has two property taxes. One's a primary property tax and the other is the secondary property tax. The primary property tax can be used for ongoing costs to operate the city. Secondary property taxes are restricted to debt payments on voter authorized bonds. The contingency or the rainy day fund represents 5% of the total budget and 25%, about 25% of our uh, general fund budget. John, please forgive the interruption. Evelyn Nelson. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm right here. Yes. <laughs> um, that contingency fund, does your auditor recommend or is there a best practices recommendation for that percentage that you maintain, that 5%? Yes, there is. And we operate it by charter requirement at four months of operations. So the requirement right now is that we maintain at a minimum $16.9 million in that fund. Thank you. This fund is set aside for one-time unforeseen or unplanned expenditures or emergencies. It can be carried over from year to year. Uh, it's totally controlled <coughs> by the city council. It's based on policy guidelines in our city charter. Uh, the amount in the fund should be equal to four months of operating expenditures per the charter. Uh, the guideline, this guideline serves as a check to make sure that we maintain an appropriate amount in the contingency fund. Uh, it's tied to the amount of the budget each year so that we don't have too little in the fund, nor do we uh, <coughs> gather too much in that fund. And that's one of the best practices that you've asked about, Evelyn, is that four months is a pretty routine best practice. It can be higher, it can be lower. I've worked in cities where it was a lot higher and I've worked in cities where it was a lot lower also. Now we'll take a look at where we get all the money to pay for this budget. Bond funding is at 47% and it's the largest source of revenue and it includes financing, for example, for city center capital projects such as streets, water, wastewater, and other infrastructure improvements. Approximately 20% of the revenue comes from the state and local taxes, such as sales taxes, primary property tax, and state shared income tax. An additional 6% is anticipated from user fees for our water, wastewater, and sanitation enterprise fund. Impact fees from developers on each house and building accounts for about 2% of the revenue while the one-time rainy day fund makes up another 5% of the total. Sorry, Howard no. Broadbeck again. Um, so <laughs> if I understand this correctly, this says that if since it's a $375 million pie, about half of it is sp funded by bonds. Those are brand new bonds? So that says you're, the city is planning to go out and borrow an additional $180 million during this fiscal year? Uh, one of the other principles is that we always budget more. You cannot spend more, or you cannot spend more than is budgeted. Yeah. So the $375 million is not what we're going to spend in a, uh, in a year. Okay. Uh, so that is a misleading figure. Okay, but if you did, this would say you'd, se you'd sell $180 million of new bonds in addition to whatever bonds the city currently holds. If we had that authority and yes, we had okay. the ability to repay them, which we don't. Okay, okay. 
What is fund balance? Uh, we're required by law to have a balanced budget at the end of the year. Unlike the federal government, uh, we don't print money. Uh, since we do not care about profit, we strive for break even in our fund balance. We want to spend what we take in. Extra funds above break even in the budgeted fund balance could come from higher than anticipated revenues and or cost savings during the year. These surplus funds can be used for one time expenses such as replenishing equipment replacement funds, increasing contingencies above the four month mark, or the council can decide whether to allocate the money or not. Where the money goes, the total fiscal year 10 adopted budget is $375 million. Of this amount, 73 million or 19% is the operating budget. Funds such as HERF, which is the Highway Users Fund, and Enterprise Funds, which are utilities, sanitation, and the stadium, represent 4% at $16 million. In general, the general fund represents about $60 million, or approximately 15% of the total budget. This is the key fund that operates the city on a day-to-day -day basis. Of all the funds in the total budget, this is the primary focus that the Citizens Budget Committee will be dealing with, 15% of the total $375 million budget. All of the other funds are already dictated by the Capital Improvement Plan or debt for past projects like the ballpark. Here are some of the sources of funds that make up the general fund. Property tax is about 9%. Other taxes, about 58%. Made up mostly of sales taxes and construction sales taxes. State shared revenues represent 19% of the budget. And charges for services, primarily development related and recreation, equals 12%. The annual budget process is essentially a year-long process, beginning with the forecast I referenced in, in the fall. This forecast projects current year estimates for both revenues and expenditures and is monitored on a monthly basis uh, in order to identify any mer emerging trends. As the year progresses, the estimates are fine-tuned and begin to formulate the resources that we ha will have available for the upcoming budget year. During this process, resources are identified as either one time available for the current budget only or ongoing like the uh, Energizer Bunny. It keeps coming in, coming in. Unfortunately, that can also vary greatly as you'll see in a moment. The budget plan is then balanced based on the projected resources matched to the city's priorities. This calendar year, this timeline shows the timeline of preparing a budget. January 10th is the last actual sales tax information that we get in order to help plan the budget. And we have to have the budget done basically by June 11th. One of the reasons, one of the primary reasons for us being conservative is that we're forecasting out 18 months. And that's hard enough in a good economy, but it's really difficult in the economy we've been experiencing lately. When we adopt the 10-11, the so the budget we're working on right now in June, we will not know for sure where we ended up in 09 and 10 because that audit, we just got the audit last month, for example, for the prior year. And that audit gave us some very good news, but we didn't know that when we were preparing this budget. And so we ended up with $4.1 million over what we had anticipated or projected uh, which is good news, but it's uh, certainly not exact budgeting. Other considerations in the development of the budget include council and community priorities. The city Council holds an annual retreat and identifies what projects or what things are on their priority list. More recently, the national and state economy have had major influences on the development of our budget, and the change in trends has been remarkable. 
In the past, growth was one of our basic considerations. Well, we haven't been growing for a couple years now. External mandates that can influence the budget both positively and negatively are things like the ARA program, which is American Recovery Act, or stimulus funds from the federal government that have become available for capital projects. We go after them as uh, aggressively as we can because it's basically unmatched money and it pays for road paving or whatever. Our park and ride lot that we just, the council approved Monday night uh, is being paid for basically uh, by a large grant. I think it was almost $3 million from ARA funds and then f almost $5 million from other federal funds. Uh, so it's very uh, important that we pursue those as possible. The next portion of this presentation focuses on key reasons behind the city's budget challenges. As you will see, the city, like many organizations, was significantly impacted uh, by the economic downturn. <coughs> Since my arrival in April of 2008, the city's budget has been a key issue on the front burner. I'm proud to say that we have worked hard as an organization to anticipate budget problems and to take proactive action in order to avoid them. This portion of the presentation will summarize the key impacts to revenues as well as the balancing strategies implemented for the current fiscal year. This table shows the impact to the city's general fund revenue. Between 2000 and 2008, general fund revenues grew more than threefold, from $25 million to $88 million. At the same time, our population almost doubled from 34,000 to in excess of 61,000 today. In 2009 and 10, the city was authorized to staff up to 593 employees. Then the recession hit, having a negative effect on the 2009 and 2010 budget, which we're operating under right now. As a result, we had to try to cut back on employee levels, and today we have eliminated 79 positions. 27 of them were filled by people. The rest were vacant. On the um, positions that you, where you reduce positions, is that where there were vacancies and you did not fill them, or you actually terminated people? As I just mentioned, 27 of the positions were still occupied, and the rest were frozen, uh, and we did not recruit after they were vacant. Okay. We are currently staffed at 514 employees or positions. Just to note, you know, decreasing from $88.8 .8 million in 2008 to today's figure, the general fund, $56 million in revenue, that is a 36.6% decrease in general fund revenue. Uh, excuse me, Evelyn Nelson again. Uh, of those employee groups, how many of those are represented by collective bargaining agreements? We have two unions recognized in the city of Goodyear, the police and the fire. Uh, they are not recognized on a meet and confer type basis, however, but they can submit a letter to the city manager each budget year at by September, recommending what their, uh, indicating what their recommendations are, and then the city manager is required to respond to them by, I think it's April or when the budget is submitted. So there's two groups that are represented by uh, labor organizations. And is there a uh, reduction in force policies inside those agreements? Uh, no, we don't have any agreements with them. Okay. Much of the general fund was uh, uh, affected by the nature of sales tax as the economy weakened in 2008. Sales tax is cyclical and volatile in nature. There's several major components tend to cycle together. Auto sales, construction, and building-related sectors all t take a nosedive at the same time. Uh, Alice Sario, question on 
on this slide 33 as opposed to 27, the one with the taxes in blue, um, about what amount of that 58% is sales tax, more or less? Sales taxes, Larry, I know you know that answer off the top of your head. Is it about half? We'll have to get you that figure, I'm sorry. And, and the other question that comes up is the population of our city. I see different figures. I see 45,000, 44,000, I see 60,000. And that makes a big difference. 20,000 people, they do pay taxes. <coughs> you can't have, you know what I mean? Yeah, the last census, our population was 46,000 some odd dollars or some odd people. That is the census figure that is still used by the state in order to distribute state shared revenues and things, for example. Our current population, however, is estimated by the Department of Commerce every year, and we got an estimate just recently for 61,500 people as of 2009, July 1st. So our population is somewhere around 61,500. We will have that certified this year as the census is conducted. That's a big swing, I think. Well, that's how fast we were growing. You're losing a third of the city? Yeah. You gain a third of the city? Yeah. And all those people were or were not paying taxes? Well, they are paying taxes, but... If they're gone, they're not paying taxes. No, but uh, we have 61,500 residents who are paying taxes. Good. So. Uh, one thing about auto sales, you know, fortunately, we don't have a lot of auto sales. Avondale is just hurting badly because auto sales makes up such a large part of their budget. And uh, so they have been decreasing uh, for a while. Uh, construction, and I'll talk about construction in more in a moment, is really devastating to the city of Fort, uh, uh, Goodyear. And that's because, as Al just mentioned, we were, we were an extremely rapidly growing community. We still are. I mean, we're growing at in excess of 4%. Many cities would die to have a 4% growth rate. But our, the last number was last year was 4%. The year before that was 2.6%. Um, and that means that there's additional people coming that the city has to serve, but we don't have additional resources to serve them. A few s uh, stabilizing sectors in the sales taxes, but the dollar amounts aren't that big, are bars and restaurants and grocery stores. They all are staying stable or growing uh, dramatically. Yes. Hi, Catherine Wallinger. Uh, in your 2004 task, uh, uh, budget, budget task committee that you had, what you had done was you had decreased the primary and secondary uh, tax by 50, per 50 cents. Right. And um, what you also did was you increased the construction tax uh, from 2 to 5 percent. Wasn't it 4.5? 3.5, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, but, but, yes. but it, yes, it did. Um, is do you have uh, dollar figures to show that um, that difference in there? And also, was there a contingency in that budget plan or that 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 task force um, plan that you can go back and and readjust the primary and secondary um, uh, taxes if needed? Um, I know that you know we've already done things you know with uh, lodging and room taxes and, and other uh, things like that. Um, other things would have to go um, via voter mandate mandated things. But was there anything in that um, particular thing where uh, you were able to kind of adjust it uh, on an ongoing basis and now on as needed basis? Uh, Catherine, yes, we have those numbers. I will have to get them for you though because I asked recently, for example, uh, what the and what Catherine's referring to is we were at $2.10 cap on property taxes, and that was lowered to a $1.60 cap on property taxes against the assessed valuation. But in exchange, we went to the 3.5% construction sales taxes. And we do have specific numbers on what that was. It was, quite frankly, an extremely positive for the city. 
because uh, the construction sales taxes in the boom years, we were collecting, I think it was almost $27 million in construction sales taxes in 2007. We are presently struggling $6 million in construction sales taxes. Is there um, an out or is there a way to adjust that? My belief is that, yes, there is. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, yes, there is. But the city council does not want to consider or hesitates considering increasing property taxes. On sales taxes, as I'll get into in a moment, the council did approve a 0 0.5% uh, increase recently. And it's important to note that 40% of that is paid for by visitors or people coming from other communities. Only 60% of the sales tax is paid for by residents. And so, but I will get that information for you also. The uh, fiscal year nine and 10 revenues and expenditures, uh, we had total resources of expected for the general fund of $60.3 million. Total uses in the general fund were $73.1 million. So the projected shortfall was $12.8 million. We also had added expenditures that we identified that the council had to recognize that brought the deficit up to $13.9 million. How did we get there? That's a good question. There are several reasons that we got there. One's baseball. And one is the Sonoran Valley annexation and the montage development that went bankrupt and left us holding the bag for a 14-member fire department that we had increased in order to provide a fire station down in Mobile and the baseball stadium. Um, and I could be wrong on these numbers. I had said 8.8 .8 million. I think that's debt and operating expenses together, a neighborhood, right? So somewhere in that neighborhood. But right there is 8.8, uh, 9.8, right there is $10.4 million of swing that the city cannot do anything about. So that's basically how we got there. Uh, there's obviously a whole host of factors working at that, but the important thing to note is that the decisions, in my opinion, the decisions of the ball teams coming to Goodyear, and the Cincinnati Reds are joining the Cleveland Indians this March 13th, I think is opening day, and it's the Cleveland Indians against the Cincinnati Reds, but that is a good decision in the long term for the city of Goodyear, and it will pay off in the long term. Plus, we're going to get up to two-thirds reimbursement from ASTA, the Arizona Team and uh, Sports Authority, uh, starting in 2017. So it will uh, pay off to the city in the long run. The other, uh, the annexation, the montage area, is an extremely strategic decision for the city. Our city limits today extend almost 47 miles uh, from uh, Indian School Road or Camelback Road down south of Mobile. That's an entire uh, transportation corridor, however. The railroad and uh, the Route 303 all of those are going to converge down there. So the future is going to be bright. I know Dick Bowers, one of the things that he's famous for in the city of Scottsdale is a very elongated city. But you drive through Scottsdale today and it's incredible. And that was very with great foresight that they did those things. So they were good decisions. Timing is everything. And unfortunately, the timing caught us. Okay, so we took a three-step approach to balancing the budget this year. We recommended reducing expenditures by $6.8 million, and that was incorporated into the operating budget. We adopted new revenue sources and enhancement measures of $4 million, and we used reserves of $3.1 million. 
this still keeps the rainy day fund or the reserves or the contingency fund, whatever you want to call it, at $16.9 million, which as I indicated earlier, is a requirement by our charter. Budget areas reduced. We had 79 positions, as I mentioned, frozen or laid off. All but 27 of those positions were vacant, but 27 of them had people in them, and we laid those off in December of last year. Development services, jobs related to development, were reduced almost 30 percent, which one would expect, because development has slowed down, and therefore development services will get cut. Other departments, we had other departments uh, submit budget reductions of 15, 20, and 25 percent. Other departments were reduced by roughly 15 percent. Public safety and courts were reduced by uh, approximately 8 percent. So the 79 positions that we have eliminated to date represent 13.3 uh, percent of the total staff that the city is authorized to engage. John? Yes. Oh, when at the work session on Monday and at city council meeting, we were told that the, si the um, revenues that sat in our rainy day fund were not really 16900000 but there was like $24 million to 20 some 27 million I that you have found an extra four to seven million I have not found an extra four to seven million and I'm getting to that in a moment I okay believe. it's coming up isn't it Mario okay and that's a, 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 a good point that you raise and it's one that we need to explain carefully um, a sales tax increase of 0.5 percent the estimated household impact of the 0.5 percent is seventy-two dollars and twenty-six cents uh, per person, or two hundred and two dollars per household. And again, I mentioned that that's only sixty percent of that is really being paid for by the resident. And so that's why, in my recommendation to the city council, I viewed the sales tax, given that we had to look at a tax. In my opinion, that that was probably the fairest way to look at it. And that means it's a $43.37 uh, $43 impact to the individual or $121.20 uh, to a family. And the way we calculate that, that figure is just the 0 .5, uh, 0 0.05 cents, uh, producing $4.3 million. And we divided by, at the time, our b b population numbers we were using were 59,500 people, and then multiplied that times 2.8 because that's an average family size in Goodyear. How are we tracking versus the budget? Total sales tax revenue through November, our annual sales tax revenue for 09 and 10 was budgeted at $31.9 million. Comparing the actual sales tax collections through November of 09, year did year-to-date collections are up approximately $100,000. So we're holding our own in sales taxes as compared to the budget. October and November are higher than July through September. This reflects the 0.05% rate increase, which was effective October 1st. And what that rate increases is that the City Council also directed that we bring it back to them in two years to review the need for it, the continued need for it, as to how the economy is performing and how the city is uh, standing in financial terms. John, one other question. My understanding that if we, in our review and our recommendations that we come up with as a, as a group, that and with the added rainy day fund, we can roll back that tax. Is that it not It can correct? be rolled back any time by a vote of the city council. Okay. Total non-construction sales tax, July through November, budget 2010 compared to actual 2010. Actual collections are trending as anticipated and expecting we're expecting to come in on budget at the end of the year. 
Year-end revenues for the second half of the year are typically higher than the first resulting from holiday sales and um, spring training activity that's going to be occurring as of March. Uh, we continue to closely monitor these revenues and present a report to the City Council every month as to how we're doing. Uh, the budget to actual year to date is about 0.3% over the budget, and that's $27,740. I mean, it's a very small amount, but the budget is holding at that point. Total construction sales budget versus actual. This chart depicts total construction sales tax, which continues to track on budget. Total fiscal year 10 budget for construction sales tax is $6.2 million, which is 50% less than the prior fiscal year budget estimate of $12.7 million. Let me just reflect for a moment. This, in January of 07, we collected $2.7 million in one month. That was the high month that I was able to find in the numbers. And we're collecting on schedule to collect $6.2 million for the entire year. Up until February of 2009, only one month of less than $1 million was collected, and that was in February of 2006. Since February of 2009, it continues to go down. Right now, I think it's at roughly 400 and some thousand dollars that we're collecting. The budget to actual variance, however, is 2.8%. We saw this coming, so we very conservatively estimated the sales tax receipts, and right now it's running $75,000 ahead or the 2.8%. Or the Total permit and plan review revenue, this shows <laughs> the picture better than anything. These are the years in different colors as to planning and development activity, and it looks over the past four years and you'll see that in 2000, and if you can see that, in 2009, in November, we collected $202,897. That's the lowest month except for October of 2009, where we collected $197,931. And that's over the past five-year period. We reached a peak of $1.9 million in planning and development fees back in the go-go days, so to speak. The total budget for development-related revenue for fiscal year 9 and 10 is $6 million. This includes $1.3 million that we budgeted from the West Core Mall that they would have to pay to us. The council just approved an extension for them at their request, and they have agreed to pay this month, they are paying $1.3 million. So including that $1.3 million, we are projecting that our development planning review will bring in $4.8 million this year, as compared to a budget of $6 million. This $1.3 million will be reflected in the January figures uh, for planning and development, and so that it isn't on our books yet at this time. Some good news about permitting for 2009 or 2009 and 10. We have November of 2008, there were 11 new building permits taken out for new homes. In 2009, we took issued 34 permits, so there was a big increase there. In December of 2008, there were 19 single-family permits compared to 57 permits in 2009. This is just signaling out single-family activity, and the numbers were hanging in there because con commercial construction was holding its own until a month or two ago. And now commercial is way down, and it's projected that it will go down deeper in this next year to two years. General fund revenues variances from budget projections. 
this table shows the general fund revenues that we're anticipating based on the trends that we're seeing in the revenues and we're on track to achieve basically $60 million. The chart identifies the four major revenue sources that make up the general fund, which is roughly 80% of the total revenue. Development related revenue as noted is estimated to fall short of budget by $1.2 million. Again, this amount includes the $1.3 million that we will receive from West Corps for the uh, construction of the mall. Non-construction is projected to be even remaining constant. Construction sales taxes is also even. We will continue to monitor this very closely to the volatility. State shared revenues are also projected to meet budget pending no legislative changes. And that's a big if because the legislature, as you know, just went into session this past Monday and there's they have to balance a budget that's four or five billion dollars in the hole. And so the cities and towns have had to fight last year and we're anticipating that we will continue to fight in order to protect the city's revenues uh, from the state trying to take them. 2009-10 general fund analysis. So the general fund for fiscal year 10 projected is total revenues of $60 million, other sources of $7 million. So we'll have total revenue of $67 million. We will have projected at this point $65 million in expenses. So we are projecting that we will have a surplus of $2 million. So we should end the year with a $2 million improvement. Now to, to uh, address the question of the extra 4.1 million, let, and let me try to do that because we stumbled all over the place trying to explain this to the city council Monday night. I think we finally got it because basically we're confusing two fiscal years. We are currently in fiscal year nine and 10 and we're preparing the budget for fiscal year 10 and 11. In fiscal year nine and 10, what the council has approved is using $3.1 million of our rainy day fund, for lack of a better word, to balance the budget. So that in effect has already been spent and that's being spent this fiscal year. And as I just said, we are projecting that we will end up the year $2 million surplus. So that means really we will only have to use $1.1 million probably. Actually, I think it'll be better than that. But that $3.1 million is in this year's budget. The $4.1 million that was mentioned was what the auditors told us in December this last month that we had saved by lowering our expenditures in fiscal year eight and nine. And so yes, we had $4.1 million additional over and above the amount that we were budgeting because we started with the council on a budget of $20 million in the rainy day fund and we took the 3.1 out of that and ended up with the 16.9. Well, the auditors came back and said, rather than 20 million, you had 24.1 million. So that's how that extra money came in. But wasn't that, having that deficit in the numbers that we were working with was a huge part in us increasing taxes, which uh, now makes the city of Goodyear the most highly taxed city in the state of Arizona? No, we are not the most highly taxed. We're right in the middle. And Litchfield Park, for example, is 2.8% and uh, uh, more than 50% of the uh, no, I mean more than 50% of the cities in the state have higher taxes than we do counting i, I think and I, I may not have the acronym right but the cifs or cfis or the added 2% tax or oh. goodyear pays an added 1% australia mountain pays 3% i pay nothing in canyon trails so how do you calculate those numbers in i don't know i just know that as an an average and what people were looking at. Well, this will, I guess this committee will find out for sure, you know, Absolutely. where we are. But we are, uh, Gary? Um, 
John, would you explain what a community facility improvement district is and how it affects the property tax of the city and why the city uses it um, so that uh, the rest of the committee will understand how this these funds provide infrastructure, prepaid infrastructure for the city, please? I sure will. I'll try, Gary. Um, basically, it's like a local improvement district, for lack of a better word. That's what terms used in most other states. A local improvement district, or a CFD, as, as uh, has been mentioned, if an area wants to build, take Pebble <coughs> Creek for an example, if they want to build and they need, let's say, $10 million of improvements of sewers and stuff, they in the past have come to the city and said, can you do a CFD? A and that means that we will go out and borrow the money and pledge the full faith and credit of the city, but are the ones responsible for paying that. And that's in order to allow them to develop. So it's only giving sewers to the area, for example, that is going to be paying for that. And so then that shows up on their property tax bill and not on, like my Canyon Trails, not on my bill or not in Palm Valley or stuff like that. So that basically is what a CFD is. It's people paying for their own improvements through their own property taxes. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Just about done. You've got all the other city taxes that everybody pays. That's correct. So, and the city. And is, yeah. If you calculate in CFDs, yes, we are uh, relatively high. I mean, Estrella, because of the cost of doing business up there, is higher than Canyon Trails because of the cost of doing business down there. I mean, so it really is appropriate that that be assessed against the people, and it's a way to make growth pay for itself, quite frankly. Bill? I was not at the meeting on Monday, so that this may go back to my earlier question. So the auditor says from 08, 09 fiscal year, we have $24 million or, or quote unquote, $4 million left over. That becomes a one-time use expenditure, is that correct from that's what we correct, about yes. Is that um, one-time use, is that by city policy, state law, or charter? How did we <coughs> determine that? It, it, it's not, when we say it's a one-time, it, it doesn't have to be. I mean, the city council has the ability to take that and use it for an ongoing expense uh, if they choose to, uh, but it's not good budget planning is what I'm saying, to use one-time monies uh, unless you have a plan on how to get out of it because at the end of next year, that money's gone, and then how do you pay for the whatever you're paying for? So it's just common sense that says it's one-time. In the follow-up to that then, if we have been experiencing, however, over the last three years, a marked decline in revenue and the city has been taking aggressive action to reduce expenses, and now we're seeing the benefit of that, can you almost make the leap that those same $4 million savings may be apparent in the 9, 10, 10, 11, perhaps not at uh, the $4 million level, but a little bit less than that, that we may not be looking at nearly as big of a Bite of the apple. I think maybe the next slide or two will answer the Boy, that is raining. Wow. Uh, I think the next slide or two will answer that. And if not, please ask the question again. Um, okay, so we have $67 million in total revenue and other sources. And we're total, exp I have already reviewed that. Total expenses are 65, so we're projecting a $2 million surplus at the end of this year. Now the forecast for fiscal year 10 and 11, the budget we're working on right now, is a deficit of $8 million. The tax generated, the, the in increase in, income, uh, in sales taxes that the council approved is producing an estimated $3.2 million this year. 
and it will produce $4.3 million during next fiscal year. That means that without the tax, we would have had a deficit or we would have a deficit in 2010 and 11 of $15.5 million that we're having to deal with. And that's what we're trying to do is look out ahead and that's why we took to the council a recommendation that, hey, help us do a soft landing and we will still cut the number of employees, we will still cut the expenses that the city is experiencing, but bring us up to this point where we can at, at least hold our own because if we were in the hole this next year, 15.5 million, it would not be pretty uh, from a standpoint of basic core services that the city has to furnish, police, fire, parks, recreation, things like that. I mentioned the $8 million. This shows an operating deficit of $8 million and it, in order to do a soft landing, we're looking at remaining PIC bonds. These are the bonds that we borrowed for the baseball stadium. We ended up the year with two, or excuse me, uh, $3 million by being able to manage that contract properly that we saved on the Reds facility. So we have in the bank $3 million. Well, the only thing you can use that $3 million for, because the bonds have already been sold, is to pay back the bonds. And so we have, we're suggesting to the council that, okay, let's use $2 million of that to pay back the bonds this next year. And then we are looking at taking the other million and paying back more bonds this year. Estimated net fund balance, I mentioned that we are projecting a $2 million savings. As I said, it will be more, I suspect, but that's what we're projecting right now. And we're suggesting that be applied to next year. So Bill, there, we're saying, hey, let's use that for ongoing because we're trying to get the city through a soft landing and the economy starts recovering and that will make up for it in the future. And then the enhanced, enhanced revenue projections for fiscal year 11, which are sustainable, are roughly $1 million. So we actually have a $5 million apply to apply towards the deficit. So the deficit instead of $8 million will actually be about $3 million. And that's where we really need your help because that's where we're at right now in our budget process and we're still looking at every conceivable angle of how to make it through that. Gary? Gary Gelser. John, just so that everybody understands, your projected expenditures for 10 and 11 maintains the, pro the appropriate level of police protection. In other words, we have six squads and they all have our full fully staffed. We have so many fire stations and they are all so many, they are fully staffed. And then we have um, code compliance inspections, parks and recreation. And basically what we're trying to do is to maintain the level of service at this point in time. And that is how you're projecting your budget. Is that correct? Yes, it is, sort of. And by that I mean that at this point in time, as we continue to work through, okay, if, this is, if these numbers are all right on the button, that means we still need to cut $3 million. Now, we are looking at employees and everything else in order to make up that $3 million. As of this moment, this budget does not in include any further reductions in employees, although we are looking at that. I mean, so yes, but we're still trying to make the city stay in the black and so all things are really on the table right now. I guess I just don't want to mislead you. I'm going to ask us to take a one minute break because they have a two hour tape <laughs> and it's about to run out and it'll take them about a minute to change it. Restrooms.